coming up. You know, anyone could rise to the top. Anyone could become prime minister. It is not where you are now. It doesn't matter how weak your stat may have been. If the issue is to finish strong. So I'm a big time farmer will be, you know. Oh, bigger farmer, bro. <laughs> farmer, bro. Hi, everyone. So last week, we started our interview with Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, the Honorable Gaston Brown. And this week, we wrap things up sharing his phenomenal story of resilience, tenacity, and hard work, plus some other issues as well. Make sure you stay tuned to find out more. Special thanks to all our current partners and sponsors. If you are interested in sponsoring or partnering with the Trailblazers, send an email to the Trailblazers247 at gmail.com. Some of our most prominent producers of them mm -hmm. in the industry tell Tony that he could not bust a female artist because wow. failing is one thing. Failing publicly is, is, a, is a very hard thing. My father always said he was growing a prime minister. Had I said I was all in my mouth, the lies were going, and I put, I sat and I saw women on the TV just lying bluntly, just just like that. Police, the all media survey, when they look at the name Ron Mushet, zero, what? zero, zero. And then they send back to say that they apologize. The lady up there never put in the number. No, seriously? In um, terms then, of help, help or like house cleaning. Yeah, my mom was a yeah, my mom was a helper back then and stuff. To be honest, I was just excited, you mm. know, to play for us I did it. I, I made my move into entrepreneurship at forty. What you know, last comments would you want to share with? You have your core values. You do the right things. It'll fall in place. For you. challenge of your career to date and how did you deal with that you know to tell the truth yeah i do not focus on challenges i mean you know i because almost invariably you know wherever there are challenges i'll be looking to exploit the opportunities that come with the challenges to the extent i don't even remember the challenges because there are always opportunities to be exploited yes uh, and, and that is always in my focus you can ask my cabinet colleagues and the time we took over the governments of the country i've said to them look there will be challenges. Don't focus on these challenges, focus on the opportunities to be exploited. So even um, within the COVID situation, there are many opportunities that we would have um, exploited uh, instead of uh, becoming overly consumed by COVID and you know, allowing um, COVID to get us, get us to take on a posture of um, failure and um, to become, um, uh, to make us, um, you, you know, feel that we don't have the capacity to perform. I mean, we would have capitalized on a number of um, opportunities. So, I mean, I will have to probably stop and think about, you know, I mean, what could have been overly um, challenging. I can't think of any um, yes. issue that, you know, would have been, um, some, um, would not have been surmountable in which I couldn't consider to be my biggest challenge. Um, the only thing I'll say at this point um, is that, and I guess this is part of the course, you know, within the political um, arena, it can be very hostile. Uh, things are said that are not true. So there may be certain things that I don't like um, about politics, especially the lies they have to say in the end those. But they are part of the course, and I deal with them frontally. Every week I host a radio program. Yes. And what I do is that, you know, I monitor the landscape, the political landscape, and when they put their misinformation out in the public domain, I answer them every Saturday without fail. Yeah. There's some people who see it as a measure, uh, or like some people see it as being thin-skinned. I see it as a form of accountability yes. and to make sure that, um, you know, every issue that they put out there, that there is a justifiable answer or to confirm that, you know, it's not true, you know, okay. and they fabricate a lot of stories. I think that, you know, my administration has had a very strong performance. Uh, so, for example, um, for the first... Um, I'd say five years after we took office in 2014, we go to country's economy by an average of 5% per annum. Wow. Every year, yeah. And in fact, That's in 20, awesome. 2018, we did 7.4%, which was the 10th fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, just last year, and you know, talking about resilience, despite the impact of COVID, we go to country's economy by 5% last year. That this is year. Amazing. Uh, yes, uh, this is confirmed by the IMF and the World Bank. This year, we are projecting between 8 to 10 percent growth. Wow. So this is not just talk. I mean, you know, we really think that, you know, it'll always be challenges, but 
just don't be daunted by them and um, focus on the opportunities to be exploited because all challenges bring with them opportunities, exploit the opportunities. Definitely. But at the same time, looking on, because so many people are easily to criticize political leaders, but you being in the position and then the man at the helm of running a country, it must not be easy. Well, I welcome um, criticisms and I welcome diversity of views. Uh, as I said to you, I'm, I'm very concerned when they resort to lies and you those half truths. But you'll find, for example, I mean, whenever I have the time, I listen to the talk shows to find out precisely what the issues are, what the issues affecting our people, or what the concerns are, and invariably we'll move towards addressing those issues. So I recognize that, you know, that type of um, uh, diversity of views and, um, you know, even the activism from, you know, those who oppose us and so on to uh, get changes for the benefit of the people. I mean, that is important in democracy. And that is why, you know, listening is important. And I do take the time out to listen. Sometimes I call on to the radio programs as well when they, you know, put false information in the public uh, because I want to know I'm listening, you know, and um, in many instances too, where they're correct, you know, I will call on to the radio program and say, okay, fine, you're correct. We'll make um, the adjustment. Indeed, indeed. And on the flip side though, what has been the highlight to date of your career? The highlight to date, well, you know, achieving the premiership of the country, I mean, that is certainly the type of achievement in which, you know, I have to thank the people of Antigua and Barbuda for the confidence, confidence and trust that they have reposed in me. And um, I have actually um, taken a position that I will never betray their trust, that I will always be very truthful to them. And um, this is certainly an honor that I will continue to cherish. So I think that that's perhaps maybe the singular most important um, achievement because not necessarily because of the status of the office of the prime minister. And another thing about me, I'm not into money and status. I live a very simple life. Uh, however, I have to tell you when it comes to entrepreneurship and, um, and earnings, I mean, I always felt that that's very important because, you know, as a Caribbean people who went to um, abject poverty during slavery and colonialism, uh, or colonialization. Um, we have a responsibility now to build our individual and collective wealth, to lift not only ourselves, but future generations out of poverty. Indeed. So you will find, for example, that I'm an ardent um, believer in wealth creation, and I'm referring to legitimate wealth creation yes. to the extent that I've asked our people to use their innovativeness, their creativity to generate wealth, legitimate wealth. I mean, that's one of the statements that uh, my political opponents have actually used against me and, 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 and say that I'm talking about uh, self-enrichment uh, as though, you know, I would have said that I would encourage people to do um, things that are illegal. But again, that's part of the course. Uh, so, you know, that, that is a situation in terms of my whole position um, and, and wealth creation. I think that generally speaking within the region, we have to do more to create individual and collective wealth so that we can improve the living standards of our people. I definitely agree with that. And I mean, those tenets and those values, you've actually even passed on to your own children. So I actually agree that that is quite cool. Well, yes. So I believe in the creation of intergenerational wealth. And I can amuse myself as an example. So uh, for about 30 years, I would have amassed a significant amount of wealth and would have literally transferred a significant portion to two of my sons. Yes. And the reason for that is to give them an early start. Now that they have the energy and obviously they have the competence to give them a leg up so that they can build on what I've given them and also to establish that culture within my family in which each generation will assist the succeeding generation. One of the problems that we have within the Caribbean is the cultural problem is that we hold everything that we own until we become old and would have passed. And it's only after we would have passed that we would have left um, or bequeath whatever assets to our offspring or to, to the beneficiaries. By then you find that the beneficiaries could be in their 60s, 70s, and do not have the type of energy in order to build on that wealth that was bequeathed to them. Yes. So invariably, they will just diminish those assets and then the uh, succeeding generations, they have to roll up their sleeves and start over. Okay. So I would like to see a more 
magnanimous um, you, you know, culture in which we help our children to help themselves, to build wealth, to build intergenerational wealth. And again, as I said, it's not, I'm not dominated by, by money. I mean, I do not consume much. And as I say, the love of money is the issue here that creates problems. They say the love of money is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. So we're not promoting the love of money. What we're saying here, money is important because the mm -hmm. same um, Bible says that um, money answers all things. So yes. we understand the need to create um, individual and collective wealth and for us to help each other to create that wealth. I mean, all of us as black people emanated out of abject poverty. That's the reality of it. Coming out of um, slavery and colonialism, that should not continue. And it's going to take, a, a, you know, increased consciousness and individual and collective effort to change that. And obviously, we have to be a little more magnanimous as well and to help each other, especially our offspring, to develop some level of wealth. And, you know, intergenerational wealth doesn't mean that it has to be millions of dollars. It could be sufficient money in which um, you could um, buy a home, educate yourself. Uh, so I don't want anyone to think that I'm saying that, um, you know, each citizen within the Caribbean, each resident should be a millionaire. That is not the argument here. It's about developing sufficient wealth so you can make succeeding generations comfortable. Definitely. I, I, I certainly agree with that. It's very important to have that generational wealth and we are happy that you are living that and we're happy that you're sharing that word of advice to all of our viewers. This is not a political program, right? But in right. terms of uh, the position on Ukraine that Antigua just announced, uh, in terms of pausing the citizenship by investment program, tell us quickly about the decision to do that and other decisions that you, you recently took. Well, you know, we have supported um, the efforts of the United Nations and would have voted um, with the majority of countries to condemn Russia's intervention into the Ukraine. Uh, our country stands firmly against any form of um, intervention or interference in the domestic affairs of other countries. And certainly the issue of um, aggression and um, military operations in, um, in Ukraine, we stand against um, that type of um, behavior. And we recognize that, um, you know, Russia's position may have been provoked by Ukraine's decision to, to join NATO and that they see Ukraine joining NATO as a security risk. Now, we fully understand that, but we do not believe that it is sufficient justification for the type of intervention that is taking place. At the end of the day, no one wins whenever there's a war and war should be avoided at all costs. So we stand firmly against that. And as you said earlier, we would have suspended our CIP, um, uh, the processing of um, CIP citizenship for Russians, those in um, Belarus, as well as um, Ukraine. And the primary reason for that is that because of the instability within the region, no successful due diligence could be completed. And we cannot process those files without completing the due diligence and make sure that these um, prospective citizens are fit and proper. Uh, so, again, it's not a case of necessarily taking sides per se. Uh, we understand the provocation, but at the same time, we've said that the provocation is no justification for war. Indeed, indeed. And we appreciate you sharing that. All right. So moving away from the politics, getting back to some more personal affairs. You were earlier mentioning about the importance of generational wealth. And of mm. course, having a wife as well, who is also involved in the political process, do you find it more difficult for both of you in, with family life or it's, you make it work? We make it work. Uh, I do accept that um, it is challenging um, for Lady uh, Maria Brown. Um, you know, she has to be the anchor at home for two children. And she's the one who does the bulk of the parenting, unfortunately. Uh, so in my case, you know, um, you know, I'm not as strained as she is, but certainly I do support wherever I can. Uh, however, it is a challenge for her, but she understands so that she has no choice but to make it work because at any day will not be daunted by challenges. Yes. Again, the matter of resilience. What's the one advice that you have been given that you would want to share with our viewers? Well, you know, if you speak in specifically from my own life, life experience, um, it says that, you know, anyone could rise to the top. Anyone could become prime minister. It is not where you are now. It doesn't matter 
how weak your start may have been. The key issue is to finish strong and to remain resilient and to stick to your goals, exercise the discipline and the hard work that is necessary. I mean, it's one thing to say that, um, you know, you're resilient, but you also have to have other values, um, the values of hard work and um, certainly the discipline not to be distracted, uh, to be focused and to work um, assiduously towards um, the achievement of your goals. I definitely appreciate that part, not only just about resilience, but actually being consistent, disciplined, and putting in the work. That is so totally. crucial. You don't put in the work, you're not going to get the results. That's the reality of it. So it's not just about saying, you know, I'm resilient. Uh, uh, it's about doing the work. And I also believe, too, that strategic thinking in everything we do is very important. That is what gives an individual a cutting edge. I mean, I believe, too, that my success in politics and even professionally would have been as a result of um, a level of um, strategic thinking in terms of what will work, what will not work what will make me more competitive um, than my opponents. So strategy is very important uh, in, what, in whatever you do, even if you're in church for that matter, it doesn't matter, all aspects of life. I mean, think strategy. So true, so true. All right, uh, on a lighter note, what's one book or movie that you would recommend to anybody to either read or to watch? Huh. <laughs> I mean, that's a hard one. I don't know why, which one to recommend. There's so many. <laughs> which, what do you like? Which one do you like? Uh, which movie now? I, you know, there's so many. I really have no favorite, but I can tell you a couple of Jamaican movies that I quite liked. Oh, sure. Which one? Uh, like, like the one with the bobsled, for example. Oh, Cool Runnings. <laughs> cool Runnings. I mean, with the bobsled team, that is what you call real resilience. To the extent, you know, have an official team. Indeed. Indeed, we actually had one of those original uh, persons from that team. He was actually on this program as well. Smile Orange was Jamaican too? Yes, Smile Orange is Jamaican. So, you know, I, I draw from different books. I mean, I draw from different life experiences. If you were to ask me, for example, um, you know, who's my favorite leader, for example? Yes, or who do you draw inspiration from? I, I, I just take positive things from different leaders. So there's really none. Wow. You know, so you are building your own legacy then, and you draw inspiration from pretty much your own experiences, which I've shared. Not necessarily from my experiences. I mean, from other leaders too. But just to say that, um, you know, anyone would have dominated my thinking or admiration. Uh, that is not the case. I mean, I can tell you, for example, um, Fidel. I mean, from the standpoint of um, his resilience. I mean, definitely. But I could not say that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so, I was so impressed by Fidel that I would model my behavior or my governance based on Fidel. Uh, Barack Obama, in terms of his achievement, for example, I'm very proud of him, um, you know, from the standpoint of his achievement. And he is a great inspiration, you know, for setting high levels of um, aspiration. So, but again, I can't tell you that I would have modeled myself um, off of Barack or that Bar Barack would have been extremely influential in terms of my own governance. So again, they're just different aspects of different leadership. And, you know, for me, I mean, I don't tie my mind to anything. I'm a free spirit. And that is why you're not going to get um, that type of specific answer in which I'm so overly impressed by any single entity, individual, that it would have impacted me um, disproportionately compared to others. I just observe and things that I think I need to emulate, I emulate them. But again, it's drawn from a wide cadre of people to the extent that there's no singular book, no singular um, leader or movie for that matter that I would necessarily want to quote. Yes. And I definitely appreciate that. All right. My final comment to you, because this program, as I mentioned, it's called the Trailblazers for a reason, because these are our viewers, are persons who not only are blazing their trails in their life, but at the same time, they're looking on to individuals like herself who have accomplished a great deal, have overcome insurmountable odds and are blazing their own path. And so what lasting advice would you want to share to our viewers? Others who look on and they're like, you know, one day they want to be like you or blaze their own path then for the most part. Just believe you can do it and to make sure that you have the resilience, the hard work, 
uh, the discipline to achieve the objective. Anyone could be prime minister. There's no special class of people who are determined to be prime minister yes. or any other objective that you may have in life. Pursue objectives, pursue them unrelentingly and make sure that you're disciplined enough and um, you work hard and to work smart. And when I say work smart, this is where the strategy comes into play. Indeed. Work smart, be disciplined, and of course, remember that our word throughout the interview, the matter of resilience. 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 In other words, don't give up. Yes. And there will be setbacks, but don't give up. You must be resilient. If you don't, if you're not resilient, then evidently you will not enjoy that pathway to success. Awesome. I want to thank you so much, Prime Minister Gaston Brown. Of course, he's the Prime Minister for Antigua and Barbuda for sharing extensively with us right here on the Trailblazers. It's been my pleasure and we want to continue to encourage you to keep up the fabulous work and to be that resilient spirit that you are. We are truly grateful and truly grateful. Blessings. Cheers. By the way, before you go, meet Farmer Brown. My um, informal name is Farmer Brown. Really? Yes. <laughs> I never know that. I call myself Farmer Brown. <laughs> Farmer Brown. Well, you see what has happened, you know, because um, you know, people exploit on the plantation. After a while, nobody won't work wrong, you know, everybody won't work in air conditioned office. Yes. So, um, agriculture has been stigmatized, but recognizing the need for food security, especially in light of COVID and even um, the situation in um, Ukraine and so on. Now, exactly. Um, 18 months ago, I chose to start a farm. So I'm farming um, about 24 acres right now. I have hydroponics, I'm doing broilers. Wow. I do um, crops. So even doing a, have a little avocado grove, a little coconut grove and so on, a big time farmer would be, you know. Oh, big up farmer Brown. <laughs> farmer Brown. <laughs> Thank you. Have a fabulous Blessing day. Blessing to you. Yes. Hey everyone, I'm Tamar McHale, a television and radio presenter, producer, communication specialist, and of course, producer and host of the Trailblazer series. I'm inviting you, yes, you, to join our family all you have to do is just click that subscribe button right below. Make sure you hit the notification bell so you're alerted as to when we have new episodes. And of course, join our family for weekly inspiring and uplifting episodes that will give you the tools, the keys, and the strategies that you need so that you can blaze your trail.